listening to episode 81 of Mida Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I'm speaking with Jeff Lawton. Jeff is a world-renowned legend in the permaculture space, the regenerative farming space. He is really into animal agriculture and using the manure from chickens and other animals to regenerate the soil. To me, this information should have been taught to us in the public school system, but it wasn't. And instead, we learned about Christopher Columbus and all of these things that maybe weren't as important as maybe growing our own real food to support proper brain function. So this information to me is really foundational. I had a lot of people send in questions and actually received a record number of questions that I've ever had on a podcast Q&A. Most of the questions were regarding what do you recommend nutrient-wise for home gardens? What's the best soil to buy? How do you create an NPK-free garden? What are the best fertilizer alternatives? What can we use instead? What soil should be we using? Questions along that same train of thought. So very similar to the nutritional supplement arena, people are very confused about what to do. And with a home garden, people go off into a big gardening store or hopefully not Home Depot or a store like that, and they'll start buying soil to grow their own food in and that's definitely not ideal especially when it's being watered with tap water and the cycles are not intact and it's not a really good start (laughs) and so this interview i tried to make it just a good beginner's episode but it ended up being pretty advanced (laughs) because we kicked it off with talking about NPK fertilizer, which I really wanted to pick his brain about. And we went pretty heavy on the NPK uh, nitrogen phosphate potassium uh, conversation, basically talking about minerals in the soil and how that relationship happens with uh, the hair roots and the tap roots. And uh, talked about pH quite a bit. And he talked about when heavy metals become water soluble at what pH and when lead and mercury start to break down. Uh, Really interesting stuff. And he also shared a lot of his uh, own philosophy, which I thought was uh, fascinating. Uh, We talked about lab grown meat and uh, what his solution is to that, which I was pleasantly surprised uh, at his solution. I loved his response with that. So anyway, we're just going to jump in. Enjoy my chat with Jeff Lawton. All right, we are live with Jeff uh, Jeff Lawton. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time, Jeff. Um, I found you uh, through YouTube, and I should have uh, gone down the rabbit hole watching all of the content you have on there, it seems like it would take years because you have so many videos and lectures up on YouTube. I was surprised. The one that I saw that I really loved was about two hours. And I think it was from over a decade ago um, where you had a white, you had a a chalkboard and you were talking about the uh, NPK fertilizer, which then creates the need for uh, pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. And you were kind of going down like the destructive domino effect um, that that fertilizer has in the soil. Um, But that's that's why I'm really excited to have you on, because uh, I I was a former vegan. I'm not anymore. (laughs) And I used to do green juices. And uh, it's my understanding that even organic, it's grown with NPK fertilizer a lot of the time. And so people think they're doing their body good drinking vegetable juices, but it could actually be causing harm. Uh, because the cycles are off in the soil. Uh, Do you have thoughts on that? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you need a full complement of food. Um, You need to give your body the chance to take what it needs. Um, 
So if you want to do that in a in a, a raw food or a vegan or a specific diet, dietary way, you've got to be a little bit careful um, because um, you, you're not you're not always that sure that you're getting all the nutritional potential uh, that your body needs to be fully vital. Um, and of course, if you if the food that you're eating is limiting limited itself in um, its own um, components, then then it gets you know more and more complicated all the time to know you're getting the full potential. So um, you know it's all about having all the potential um, available, and and for living organisms to choose uh, what they what they need, uh, rather than um, a forced food scenario when th where things are um, so so soluble we don't really know what we're actually consuming we don't know what we're eating um we don't know the full components of the of the food we're eating and 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 the way they've um lived and grown and and and, and been fed is the same sort of chain of events interesting um have you uh, looked into like justice von liebig it's there's not a lot of information on the on that guy like the chemist i have a book on him um, back in the, the mid 1800s, he supposedly discovered minerals and plants by burning them down to ash and then trying to count minerals. And then he only saw NPK. And that's my understanding of how the whole thing got started. And then the fertilizer was sent worldwide because of his erroneous uh, experiments, um, which I think Sir, Sir Howard um, kind of talks down about like the experiments that justice did. Um, but is that, is that kind of your understanding that it was kind of just started from a false pretense kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, the major elements, nitrogen, phosphate, um, uh, and potassium are, um, are, are definitely the major elements and, and Lieberg or Lieberg, however you want to say his name. Um, he, his major statement was that that's all plants need to grow and they don't need anything else, which is true. Um, but it's the um, the general health they have um, in that condition, and um, it was just lined up historically at the same time as when we could um, produce sulfuric acid in in, in laboratory. Um, so once it was uh, possible to produce um, manufacture um, a valuable acid. Uh, we could break down rocks and make soluble fertilizer. A myriad of potassium was the first fertilizer. Um, and um, when you water it onto a plant, it has to uh, it has to take it in because the plant is a pump um, from from root to, to growing tip, and um, it can't not drink. So it hold, it, it's hydraulics. You know, it's wilt and hydraulics um, are, are held together by a column of water. So th it has no choice. So once a uh, the food, um, some of the food that it needs, and it may well be completely out of balance and way oversaturated, but it's in the water rather than interacted with the hair roots and uh, uh, soil organisms. Um, so instead of a transaction between life and the soil and the hair roots, it's more or less a, a tap root um, saturated through through soluble materials in the water cycle. Um, then, then everything's a balance. The the plant may survive okay because it will survive only on, um, you know, your basic main elements: nitrogen, uh, phosphate, and potassium. But all the other elements, and then some of the more interesting elements, and those combinations are are then in 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 had a balance, but also deficient. So we get, you know. Um, um, the wrong levels of concentration and the wrong availability and 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 it's um uh, and then that comes to reflect our health and and majorly reflect um uh, affect the uh, the function of soils the life in soil it was more or less that point where we decided not to try and understand any more about the life in soil because it's so complex we more or less ignored it and and and, and the chemists made it irrelevant made it look irrelevant um, life sciences are the soft sciences. They're not really easily proven. Um, they're always changing. They're very hard to measure if they can be measured at all. Um, where hard sciences are locked up. So you've got a, a, a standard of how you assess an experiment. So um, at, at that point, the, the sort of chemists took over 
um, our, our, um, our soul production. It just got more and more and more and more and more complicated. Um, as we as as the issues started to arise, uh, the complication in in variations of chemistry started to, to evolve that we were, we we we've ended up using on on our food supply. That's a great way to put it. That chemists took over <laughs> the whole situation. So I I kind of want to go back to the plants only need three minerals because uh, I know the human body uses tons of trace minerals and. You know, there's the macro minerals like magnesium and potassium and sodium and calcium, but there's like 84 plus, like there's all these trace minerals that the body can use. I thought it was similar to plants. Like I've heard that for plants to have a strong immune system, they need at least 15. Is that not true that they, they really only need those three to be healthy or? No, it isn't necessarily, you, you know, it depends what you call healthy, but they're, they're, they won't die. They'll, you know, much like us, we can live on very, very basic foods. Um, but how long we live and in what condition we live. Um, so their general health, their general vitality, their, their reproductive capabilities, um, they're all compromised, but they're still alive. Um, and they may actually be um, demonstrate obesity like we do. So, you know, if you've got a lot of refined food um, and uh, hypersaturated food in, in certain areas, um, your body gets overloaded. Um, you can't avoid... Um, the food that's soluble, particularly in, in soluble food in, in water, in liquids, it, it's hard to see what it is that you're, um, it's almost impossible to know what it is that you're taking into your body when it's um, uh, completely dissolved and soluble in, uh, in fluid form. So um, it's quite easy to, um, to drink 10 to 15 cubes of sugar, but it's pretty hard to eat them. You know, if you put if you put ten to fifteen on, but you can a soft drink easily, and and that's the same with a lot of things. Um, yeah, we can we can you know we can drink um, large amounts in a soluble form that we couldn't eat in in solid form uh, without our body actually rejecting it. That's really interesting because I remember in the lecture you were saying that this fertilizer with the water it makes the plants bloat, like they get. Like they just blow up, right? <laughs> well, yeah. There's also a, a to 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 stabilize the the fertilizer. It's often bonded in a salt, so it's inevitable that the plants are taking up uh, a certain amount of salt, and that's often the cadmium. And um, so we we've often got um, an extremely large amount of cadmium um, that we absorb uh, through um, plants that are grown on on um, soluble fertilizer. And um, we're often right on the edge of cadmium poisoning, actually, just just outside of cadmium poisoning. Um, and, and that's more or less looks like the gauge for um, fertilizer application is what's the point when people um, get poisoned um, with cadmium. So the salt then makes the plant want to, need to absorb more moisture, um, take up more fluids because uh, it needs to compensate for the salt content it's taken up. And that actually is like uh, an extreme bloating effect. Uh, the plants may look heavier, um, um, they'll sell for a, a weight price rather than a nutritional price. So if we were, if we were selling our food on uh, nu nutrition, um, that'd be a completely different game. But we, what we've specialized in is that we've gone on all, most of our food, if not all of our food, drop the nutritional quality to bulk out the, the volume um, because that's the way it's sold. That's a good point. Yeah, with animal agriculture, I know they use um, a lot of unsaturated fats for that purpose, um, especially with pork, uh, but also with with other animals, uh, uh, chickens, just to fatten them up. And those those polyunsaturated fats are excellent at that. Those those seed oils and other things. Yeah, well, a lot of our, our, our grains and our vegetables are, are enormously more productive than their, their wild relatives, and and there is an advantage to that at a certain point. But then on, when you look at some of the, the old heirloom varieties, they may be you know, <clears throat> 16 times more productive today with modern hybridization and, and today genetically en engineered varieties. But you, you, you've ended up with, say, wheat that's 16 times more productive, but one twelfth the original nutrition. Wow. <laughs> so the older varieties, the, really, the, the first developed varieties, 
we're 12 times more nutritious. So in theory, you, you don't need to eat as much. And we've got a lot of that in our food supply. You need to eat more to get the same nutrition. So you're literally wearing your body out to try and absorb the, 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 the nutrition that you require. Um, and, and some of that doesn't get passed through. So there you go, you've got a, obesity and, and, and dysfunctional uh, bodies. And, and the same organizations that, that produce that food and produce the chemical fertilizer also produce the pharmaceuticals that will keep you alive, but not necessarily healthy. So you, you become dependent. Now you become dependent on, on the pharmaceuticals. And it's really the same companies that make the chemical fertilizers that got you into that state in the first place. So it's a win, win, win in every direction for, for that sort of approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's no freedom there. You've got no choice. Your choices are gone. Where you could, you could, you can get yourself in a situation where you choose and you know what you eat and you know who you are because of that. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that. Um, I was going to say like the, the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Meat Burger, like these fake lab meat products are blowing up right now, you know, because plant-based documentaries and all these things. And I'm over here talking about mineral balance and promoting like raw goat's milk and pastured eggs and, and grass-fed beef liver um, for these minerals, because it's my understanding that the animals uh, can really save us, especially at this time in history, um, because they have the ability, like goats, I mean, you could feed them uh, copper shavings and they'll convert it into a bioavailable form. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, everything's really a conversion. And, and as a permaculture designer, um, you efficiently position things so that you get um, the most valuable conversions. So you're converting you know, um, food scraps into eggs, let's say, food scraps into worm castings and, and, and back into vegetables and back into food scraps again. Um, there, are, there are miracles of conversions going on all around us when we set up a productive ecosystem. It's um, it, it's all a matter of doing those those positive interactions between elements that give you those those you know amazing conversions. And um, if you are if you're comparing something like you know, um, uh, the liver of animal, you know goat's liver, um, cow, cattle, you know cow liver, you know any of those, um, the, the type, you, know, you need a very small amount. Of, of, of something that's concentrated as an animal liver, as a food supply, as long as it's clean, as long as it's an organic animal, as long as it's had you know, positive interactions itself in the landscape. Um, not to say you can't do it with vegetables and you can't vegan or raw food, uh, that's all possible, but you've just got to be very careful how you go about it and you eat a lot more bulk. Yeah, definitely. Um, before we go into so some solutions a little later, I still want to stick on the uh, people, some people would call it doomsday, but I think there's there's uh, some solutions as you found to these problems. Um, but just to to stick on the the problem for a little bit longer um, with the imbalance that we're dealing with, um, have you researched like the effects that acid rain has on the microbes? Because it's my understanding that burning fossil fuels and ships in the ocean. Um, we're getting 130 million tons of sulfur dioxide every year, 53 million tons of nitrogen oxides, and more than 3 million tons of heavy metals like constantly kicked up into the, the atmosphere. And so that has to come down to the earth through dry deposition or through wet you know, rainfall. And that ends up in our aquifers, rivers, lakes, and, and obviously the soil um, killing and mutating the, the microbes in the soil, um, and then further throwing off the, the cycles kind of like synergizing in a really harmful way with the NPK fertilizer. And I've seen like record acid rain at like 2.2 pH, um, which I believe it's my understanding, like kind of washes out the fulvic in the soil. Um, any thoughts on all that? <laughs> yeah, it starts to get pretty dangerous. Um, you're going to get those low pH acid rains at high altitude, particularly in snows. Um, and uh, you really start to get concerned at um, 4.5 because it's not until you get to 4.5 um, that uh, heavy metals become more soluble. So, you know, lead, people worry about lead, and, and in, unless you're, you've got a pH below 4.5, which most plants don't like, 
you, you like to have your garden about 6.5, um, just a little bit acid. Seven is neutral and every point in either direction, larger numbers, eight is alkaline and the higher the number up to 13 is getting more alkaline, but each number is, is, is rhythmic. So it's a power of 10. So if you go from seven to six, you're 10 times more acid and six to five, you're a hundred times more acid and five to four, you're a thousand times more acid. Well, at 4.5 heavy metals start to dissolve and you get uh, lead dissolving if it's sitting around, it becomes water soluble and then you get schizophrenia. Um, and mercury as well will, will start to break down. You'll get Mad Hatter's disease, but the real, uh, problem is 3.5 at 3.5 alu aluminum um, becomes water soluble and all plants die so once uh, once you have aluminum uh, soluble in the soil and most soils have, have aluminum oxide and hydroxide present um, then you'll get complete plant die off you know all forests will die uh, and and it'll it'll take 3.5 for 20 minutes and it'll buffer alkaloids out from the from the plants, uh, from the trees. But if they keep having to do that, then they'll you'll get big t tree die off. North America, you lost all your chestnuts, um, and Europe lost all its elms. And now it's losing its ash, um, and it's really uh, the uh, the trees buffering the acid rain. So you know, there's there's the difficult point. Um, if you've got enough organic matter. Um, on you know fall into the ground um, which really comes from ecosystems majoring in forests majoring in trees they we call them forests but they're actually not just like plantations of trees it's an ecosystem um the organic matter and will 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 buffer all that bring it back to neutral quite well but you know we're, we're diminishing ecosystems as we're increasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and um it, it's probably biggest turn because um, you can't afford to lose more forests because of acid rain and not have the organic matter to buffer the acid rain itself. So, it's, you know, someone's got to stop somewhere. We've got to stop throwing, you know, so much um, car, car exhaust is part of it, um, but majorly um, fossil fuel um, power stations and, uh, in, you know, old fashioned in industry. So these things have to stop. Sooner or later, they have to completely stop, um, and we have to increase the, the you know organic matter production from ecosystems. So we don't really have choice. Um, we're mucking about with the atmosphere, and you know as we as we potentially um, create more dramatic weather, we're caught. We don't you know it, it's it's what you're getting is you're getting a, a hotter day and a colder day and a windier day and a wetter day for that day on record everywhere at once, any day of the year. Now, any day of the year, you can, you can be in an extreme scenario that's hotter, cooler, wetter, windier, drier, for that day on record everywhere. Now you're, you're, you've, what you, you're ending up in a, a climate that's unregulated um, and, and it's, you know, we're seeing extremes maybe generally warming a little bit and that may be a natural background pattern it may be that we are naturally warming a little bit um not quite so dangerous as the extremes because uh, as we go to extremes we get more and more environmental die-off get more and more ecosystem die-off because major species you can't afford major species dying out and and the major species are the trees all ecosystems major in trees um, so as you take out the framework, um, you really reduce the, the, the capacity of an ecosystem to buffer these extremes. And so um, that that was something that people want to argue about, but that those are facts. That's a fact. And you can see the links to industrialization. You can see industrialized America losing its chest, industrialized Europe losing its its ash and its elm. And, and, and of course, the classic was, you know, the forest, start, uh, the black forest starting to die. Black forest becoming a dead forest in Germany. And that really changed Germany. That changed, you know, public opinion. Yeah, it's really interesting to see, like, the, the debate, uh, because I see a lot of people talking against um, animal agriculture, like even attacking, like, homesteading small family farms, which to me is just insanity. But they're not looking at the real problem, which is, you know, bunker fuel. And as you mentioned, all of these old industry uh, burning fossil fuels. 
which seems to be doing way more harm. I mean, there is methane from the factory farms being emitted, but I mean, no one's talking about the sulfuric and nitric acid in crazy amounts, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I probably uh, overshot that by quite a long way is soil erosion. So, you know, the, the amount of soil that we, we lose from agriculture is continues to increase, and that's our base resource. So um, in, from an industrial point of view and, and possibly an economic point of view, um, it's considered ideal that we just make laboratory food and don't involve ecosystems, you know. So you, you're, you're growing meat on collagen frames, you know, you can make eggs in a factory, in a laboratory, you can make fish in a laboratory or fish substitute, you can make all your vegetables and they can taste like the vegetables that, that you get outside and all your fruits, you know, you can grow a laboratory banana and a pineapple and a mango. And um, then there's now um, a proposal that the production of food in a laboratory in a very small area with very small amount of water can actually be a, a hydrogen production system as well. So it will produce energy. So have a byproduct of, 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 of fuel that can be used for electricity. And um, economically, people think that's a great idea. Um, you know, we, we don't need the ecosystems. Um, and I think it's a good idea as well. I think it'd be great if we just made it illegal to sell food. Um, and um, you have two choices. You either grow your own or you buy laboratory food. And that would kind of divide us possibly into two new species, you know, those that are, uh, they're growing their own food and, and awesome. benefiting the ecosystem. And those people want to live in a sort of industrial city factory life and just eat laboratory food, you know, and let them go for it. I think if they can take up very little area and produce their energy from the laboratory food, I think they're entitled to it. They can have it. I'm not, but anyway, you can have it. Um, and um, if we if we made it in order to sell food, then we'd stop damaging the world. It'd be great. You know, I don't know what the percentage of people would choose a permaculture lifestyle against the laboratory, factory, industrialized lifestyle. I don't know. It'd be great refer ref global referendum. You know, um, who's who's going which way? And and like for a long time, we've considered if you're not producing. If you're if you're not producing soil, if you're not increasing the that's, fertility that's of awesome. soil, and you're not increasing the volume of soil, then um, you should be given just two or three years to achieve that, or you should um, you, you should you should be taken from the land. The land should be taken from you. You should you shouldn't be allowed to farm. Um, you know, farming should be a soil creative um, exercise, um, and um, you should have a, a certain level of diversity or increase the diversity in, in, in your action, but definitely increase the fertility and uh, um, quality and quantity of soil. should create soil. So, you know, to do that, you have to, you have to um, produce from a productive ecosystem. You know, you really, you've designed a productive ecosystem and it, and it benefits the environment as you gain productivity. Uh, but actually, you know, we have enormous problems with soil erosion, massive. It, it, it's, you know, our biggest problem by a long way, and it's not being addressed much. Um, we're out of scale, way out of scale. You know, our size ratios are uh, so far out of scale, we can't see um, a sustainable scale. You know, we, we can't go small enough. So it's really, it, 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 it has to come back to urban agriculture and perimeter urban agriculture. And outside of that, rangeland on appropriate slopes and forestry on the steeper slopes. And it's not long, it doesn't go very far out from population bases before you're back to wilderness. With, with that kind of matrix, we can produce the same amount of nutrition on four to six percent of the present area used by industrial agriculture worldwide. That's not hard to do at all. And, and the figures prove it. You, know, you, you see these urban gardens that produce enormous amounts of food per square meter you know, it's massive you know that, and there's lots of them out there you know the path to freedom deep green permaculture you know happyearth.com these are all famous urban gardens that have massive production for the for the small footprint and incredible diversity so if you have that through your urban space and then perimeter urban agriculture producing bulk um carbohydrate 
you know, you've got your um, your calories. Your nutrition is really urban. Your calories are, are perimeter urban, and outside of that, rangeland and forestry on appropriate slopes. Um, you've got a pretty good model. It's not that complicated to achieve, and and you and you've got good employment, like meaningful work, and plenty of employment. I love those solutions. That's that's awesome. Uh, we're located in North Idaho here, and. I wasn't raised in snow as like a Southern California kid. And so it's really interesting, like homesteading where we have pretty heavy snow, like over 10 feet, um, we're in like a little valley, 2000 feet elevation. And I've just been focusing mostly on animal agriculture because I find that's a little easier to do in this really cold environment for half the year <laughs> than trying to grow plants. I mean, you could do some in the greenhouse, but, um, it's definitely a challenge being at this latitude. <laughs> well, you get a break because mm -hmm. you've got a winter. Yeah, <laughs> just save the seeds. Well, your food's very nutritious. So, and, and your day length is very long in winter, in summer, and, and your sun's still quite low. So, you know, as you go to the cold climates, um, the nutritional quality of the food goes up and your production um over the season it's very very high so you know it's it, both areas of the of of the world's climates where there's a, a deficiency moisture um have the same scenario so if you're in the hyper arid you have no moisture in the hot time of the year and much is growing because everything's evaporated and in the cold climate you have no moisture because everything's frozen but in both places, um, the nutrient density of food is much higher than the tropics. But you can you know four four crops a year in the tropics. But the sun is very very high, and it comes up at six and goes down six at the equator year, and you can grow every day shallow, and and you really can't every day of the year a full day. So you work a short day. You only work from six till nine, and from three till it's every day. But you, you know you. As you go towards, you know, Alaska and northern Russia and places like this, um, you're, you're getting 18 hour days and, and that's 18 hours of low sunlight. So the biggest vegetables and the most nutritious food are grown where you have that long day, low sunlight in, 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 in cold frozen and preserved. So you've got, you know, you've got good soil fertility because the growing season where the fertility is used. Now, exactly the same in the deserts, but it's on the other end of the spectrum. You've got nothing decomposes, not because it's frozen, now because it's dry, because there's no moisture for repose. And when it does, if you do the right thing, the nutrient has to get you through the whole year when it doesn't rain. All the nutrient, you know, all, all of the, the valuable elements in the soil are locked up and frozen, and they can't decompose because it's all frozen. It's like a, like a fridge. <laughs> a deep freeze when it thaws out it releases that nutrient you get very high nutrition food right and you've got to grow enough to store to get it through the through the winter and it's pretty easy to store because everything stores when it's that cold and in deserts a similar scenario everything stores because it dries all you have to do is get underground in some kind of cellar in both those climates and you've got that stored high nutrition now you've got to plan it and it means for like three months of the year, you've got to work long days. You know, you heard of Richard Perkins, Latitude 60 in, in Sweden? I think it's a different Perkins, but yeah. But he has a nine, he has a 90 day growing. Wow. 90 days. <laughs> 90 day growing season at Latitude 60. I mean, I live in the subtropics, you know, I'd, I'd love to have 240 days off. That's a pretty nice vacation. <laughs> I mean, we go every day of the year. I was planting. I was planting. Uh, I, I was planting potatoes today. You, you're in potato country, Idaho. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just planted ten kilos of Dutch cream. Um, we have to grow them at the end of our. We have to grow them at the beginning and end of our winter. That's awesome. Because it's too hot and humid in the summer. That makes sense about the cellar for both environments. That's that's super cool. Um, yeah, everything you said makes sense. That's that's really interesting. Um, I did have one question for you about minerals. And um, 
basically the difference between an organic mineral and an inorganic mineral. And I find that this isn't really talked about at all in the health community, but I think it's, it's kind of foundational for health. Um, and with organic, it's basically a metallic encapsulated in a carbon. Um, so you have like that negative positive to make a battery for an organic mineral is my understanding, but for that actually to happen, you need, uh, 35,000 plus bacteria, 5,000 plus fungus to actually have, and all the, you know, the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, the sulfur cycle, all of those cycles intact for a plant to convert an inorganic mineral and encapsulate it in the carbon, you know, for that cycle to, to happen. Is that, yep. is that accurate or? <laughs> well, we don't know the exact numbers, but it's a transaction. So on a plant, it's a transaction across what we've what we've called the rhizosphere, the atmosphere around the hair root. So there's a there's a transaction across the rhizosphere into the uh, into the plant. So the plant has a deficiency of a certain element, and and one of the soil organisms, um, and there are so many that we don't know anything about. 50 million genus of bacteria and 50 million genus of fungi and we only know a little bit about one percent of those we only know a little bit about that one percent so um it's that transaction of those living elements across to the plant and the plant gives back um what it has in surplus which is carbon made by my you know as starches and sugars by starches and sugars made by photosynthesis so um, it, it's not a lot different to the organisms in our gut. So the garden of our gut has the same diversity of organisms, or should have, or should have, should I say. And it's the, you know, we, we don't, you know, it's not our body that eats our, makes our food available. It's the organisms in our gut that makes our food available. And most of them should be aerobes, like in the soil, not anaerobes, which are like pathogens. So if we create the wrong environment in our gut, then we end up with pathogens and then we end up with problems. And, th and then what happens is that, you know, you get all kinds of strange um, health problems with the gut, like Crohn's disease, where, you know, the, the, the intestinal wall starts to collapse. So you're, you're, you're losing the transaction barrier. And, and you'll find that uh, as people culturally move very quickly in, in one generation from uh, a developing world to a developed world, you'll you'll find that 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 people feel in a very quick period of time they so they'll value having a disinfected house. They'll value using lots of bleach and 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 disinfectant and blue loo and everything. And so the house has no organisms in it. Right, it's actually sterile. Where normally we lived in houses that were full of fungus and all kinds of, you know, sourdough. In this kitchen, you're talking to me in the straw bale kitchen, it, it's too easy to make sourdough, you know. It, it's in the building. Uh, so many breads have been made in this kitchen. Um, and and that's, that was tradition. We were interacting with all these beneficial life organisms. So when you totally remove that and then you feel privileged to eat processed food, all of a sudden you can have packeted pasta and you can have, you know, all kinds of, a, a highly refined processed food because that's modern and it's understandable that people move from one culture to another and suddenly they're in a privileged position feel like they're entitled to that come with some level of entitlement oh then the next generation have all kinds of issues in their health particularly gut gut problems because their body has no relationship with the microorganisms that should be the ecosystems that interact with our food through into our body and it's the same in the soil. So if you actually eat it, processed food that, that itself didn't have any much interaction with soil organisms, now you've got the same issue where in your living conditions. But I, I've, I've had parents um, upset with me because we've had school children touching soil. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, they're, 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 they're worried that, that their children shouldn't touch soil. So... There are uh, people that have never touched soil. They've never touched the ground. And, and you can only expect your immunity to be very vulnerable wow. at that point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely feel the difference when I have my, my hand in soil, especially in the greenhouse that's full of life. <laughs> um, 
I had one one last question before we jump into the Q and A, uh, related to iron and aluminum, and if you've looked into the relationship between acid rain and those two elements, because I know they're both of those are linked to numerous diseases. Um, like I've had a, a lot of guests on my podcast talking about iron overload, which is very prevalent today, especially in heart disease and Alzheimer's and diabetes. Um, it's mostly iron, not really the sugar too much causing a lot of issues, but um, it's my understanding the rain is so acidic just worldwide, but in a, a lot of areas, especially that it erodes uh, iron and alumina, which are highly present in the earth's crust in excess amounts. And then that gets into the soil and then ultimately into the plants and they soak it up. Have you looked into that or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll get certain plants will, will, will harvest iron and, 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 and copper like thistles, right? And it's usually because the pH has changed mm -hmm. because uh, the soils have become too acid or too alkali. So you get desert thistles when, when the, when the desert goes too alkali, um, and usually means that it's been the it's lost its compaction, it's lost its ability to hold moisture, it's reduced even more its ability to hold moisture. And the other way around in the in the humid climates, which become more acid when they're compacted in in heavy rain times, overgrazing during rainy periods, will cause extra compaction, and then you'll get thistles germinating because the pH is also locked up the iron and copper. Mm. And thistles harvest iron and copper, so the reaction of um, problems the, the 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 cause is one thing, but the reaction is often a particular plant germination condition. So if you burn the soil, you'll get um, potassium harvesters, etc. You'll get an indication from what germinates. So. We have enormous amounts of iron here in Australia. In, obviously, you know, we're an iron exporter. Um, so if you get too much rain here, you get very wet periods or you get um, a lot of compaction, right? You'll get iron oxide coming to the surface. You'll get rusty, like looking water. It's actually an anaerobic bacteria that once it comes to the surface, into the air, it forms what looks like a sort of fuzzy, rusty water. Um, that's large amounts of iron. So all of this, right, can be balanced with pH. All of this is a problem in the way we address our growing systems. So if we're growing on such large areas that we can't use cover crops and return the plant bodies and allow allow the roots to decompose in the topsoil and, and return the plant bodies to the to the surface as surface mulch, or we're, 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 we're including actual you know, dead mulch on the surface, or we're including compost or worm castings or compost teas and biofertilizers, which will all increase the amount of life in the soil, which have fast life cycles returning their bodies to the soil. All of that will buffer pH. If, if, you're, if you're totally bare soil, open agriculture over very, very large out of scale sizes, you're going to get more and more problems with the acid rain not being buffered. So as really, we know that, that agriculture is highly deficient in trees and the interactions of trees, and particularly the fungal interaction between tree roots and the tree fields. So because we're out of scale and because we've got so much potential for acid rain continuously coming down from industry, now, we have to include more and more and more trees in the agricultural production. We have to scale our fields so their interaction is more positive than ever before. And, and we're going to have to keep increasing that as this problem in, gets worse, because it's not getting any better. You know, as we get more and more potential for acid rain, right, the size of our fields have to get smaller. They're not. They're still getting larger. And not in all cases. There is some good things happening. I mean, it's getting better and better and worse and worse at the same time. You know, when enough of us realize how bad it's getting and look at the, what's happening on the good side, we have to get that transition across. And we only need 11 to 18% for a tipping point. If Mal Malcolm Gladwell is right, who wrote the book Tipping Point, studied all the, you know, uh, epidemics, pandemics, uh, fashion, um, raises, 
revolutions, ideologies, all these, they all tipped into everybody accepting it at about 11 to 8 percent. It wasn't 51 percent. You don't need to tip over the 50 percent mark. It's, it's not as big as people think. So once 11 to 18 percent of us realize, wow, we've got to do it and we, we won't be part of it. A um, very small amount of us will be part of it, probably only 2% realize we're clever enough to do it to create absolute abundance, absolute paradise. Um, and once we have an abundance of fresh air, absolutely pure, clean air to breathe, an abundance of absolutely clean water to drink, and an abundance of diverse, nutrient-dense, absolutely clean food that's, you know, zero food miles, zero food time, and zero food guilt, to consume. Um, and once we realize what sensible housing is, warmth, friendship, and community, um, we'll what will naturally happen is that we'll be considered wealthy and our fertility rate will drop and our popula overpopulation problems will disappear. It's called the biological effect. If you want to find, you know, if you want to find the large fertility clinic countries that are where people where people are wealthy, they have trouble, where they think they're wealthy. I mean, I don't think monetary wealth is not real wealth, but when people have a lot of <laughs> but social service, they feel very safe, they have good income, um, they consider themselves wealthy, uh, they, have, they have infertility problems. If you go to places where people are suffering, um, even war zones, and there's no infertility at all, where people are starving, they're in conflict zones. There's no problem with infertility. Um, and that's the same in all living things. We, you know, when we're in, where, when our species is endangered, our fertility comes up. Um, when we think we're privileged, our fertility goes down. So we have to redefine wealth because it's no point in us all being wealthy. Right? We haven't got enough worlds. We need many worlds to do that, to be, you know, to, to demand that many resources. And it's no good all of all, all of us becoming peasants and poor and 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 suffer because we'll overpopulate the world. The clever thing is the redefinition of wealth in the middle ground, when you know there's a lot of equality and a lot of understanding of how we fit in, uh, how we fit into balance with the ecosystems, and then overpopulation is issue um, because we all understand you know what it is to be truly wealthy. It is that, you know, many people today die of air pollution. Thousands, something like 7,000 people a year in India die of air pollution. I think it's something like 500 people a year in London have a diminished lifespan because of air pollution. I mean, this is the actual air we're breathing. I mean, that's without looking at what's going on in water and food, um, you know, and, and we live in houses that don't heat themselves, cool themselves, catch their own water. And, and, and have embodied energy with replaceable components. Our ancestors did. Our ancestors did better than us with houses. Um, that's why, you know, some of the old houses are, are very valuable today. Um, and community, well, we have no, the wealthier we are, the less community we have. All the famous people live in, a, in their own self-designed prisons with, you know, razor guards and uh, ra ra razor wire and, and, and armed guards. Um, if you want community, you go to poor, you know, you go to impoverished countries, you know, you go into the third world and um, people have no, no money and no assets, uh, but they have uh, lots and lots of community and they, they support each other. But the richer we are in the first world, the only thing we have is gadgets, really, to show our wealth. And um, the richer we are, the less community we have. We, we go out of our way not to know our neighbours. We try not to know our neighbours. We don't want the complication. Um, which is not very nice, really. Yeah, a lot of really logical points and solutions there. I think like clean air, food, and water is a lot more logical than masks and hand sanitizer. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's jump into the Q and A um, in, in the last stretch of this. Uh, we have quite a few questions, and I definitely like to go into some solutions. You mentioned a lot, but just to kind of expand on them or kind of summarize them would be great. Um, the first one I thought was really great. Uh, my friend asked, why are P and K in NPK called artificial? I thought P and K were mined. Uh, um, 
I think so. Is that just semantics? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really understand the statement, actually. <laughs> I guess uh, people are wondering, like, if why are you saying they're why are you saying they're artificial? <laughs> like, I guess if the p if the phosphorus and potassium are mined, do they cause damage to the soil, or is it more like you said a pH problem? Like, you kind of have to look at the whole picture. Uh, yeah. All right, they're not always mined. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> right? They're not always mined. They're, they're, they're mined in concentrate, yeah. But phosphate is actually um, harvested by fungi um, and uh, brought back with a system, with a, a process called plasmic streaming um, down long hi-fi nets to particular tree species and accumulated by palms and banksias and casuarinas and, and probably many more that we don't know about. And, and, and phosphates are, uh, are accumulated in a lot of bird manure. So most bird manure is high in phosphate. And um, it, it doesn't have to be big birds with big pups. It's lots and lots of little birds do a lot too. So um, you can see, you know, enormous amount. Now, birds don't urinate, right? So they, they produce a package, which is both urine and feces together. So I was recently in Saudi Arabia. Um, actually, I was caught there in the coronavirus scenario, and um, I was out in extreme desert, um, and um, we were looking at doing large, very, very, very large earthworks to harvest uh, large amounts of water when it comes. And there was um, old trees around, not much, but there was a few, and we are on a very large 173 square kilometers out near Riyadh in central Saudi Arabia, but I found some trees that were like 18 inches, half a meter across in the trunk. Um, just the odd one or two, sometimes in little groups. And if you, if you walked around underneath those trees, um, there was a 50 mil to two inches, let's say, of small, tiny bird manure all the way underneath the trees. Everything was saturated with bird manure because when the temperature goes over 45 to 50 degrees centigrade, um, the birds actually, it's too hot for birds to fly, so they find a tree, and and it would be great to see the trees at that at that temperature. They'd be absolutely full of little birds, and 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 they're they're obviously concentrating huge amounts of phosphate in in, uh, in the drip line of these trees. And one can only imagine what happens when you reforest the deserts of the world um, with that sort of amount of accumulated nutrient around. So, you know, we've, we've got a lot of phosphate that came from uh, concentrated bird manure of seabird colonies because they colonize. And um, if you can get an island in a, in a dam, in a, in a pond, an, an island, that you, you know, you make an island because you've got a big shallow pond that you've, you've made and you've got to do some extra with the soil. If you're lucky enough, you get like a cattle egret colony and you've got your own guano mine um, you can do the same with a bat cave and you can get the same sort of quality from bat manure. Um, so, you know, um, it's not beyond our capability to create our own phosphate accumulators in, in bird attraction. It's not that complicated to do that. Sometimes you just do it by accident, but it wouldn't take many generations to actually be able to do that professionally. Um, and create a wonderful thing. So you know, we we just need to favour the fungi and the and 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 the birds of the world uh, in the right way. The the birds that that create colonies. And um, yeah, we don't have to rely on the you know mining. I like mining. Little little mines here and there are great. Big mines out of scale again are a problem. I think every community should have a little mine here and there. You know, we've done that forever. But, you know, they don't need to be these massive things. So many things we do are good, but they're just way out of scale. We just got sort of greedy about how we how we uh, get bigger and megalomaniac about everything. Yeah, and I think that gets to the heart of, of the NPK thing, because uh, at least a third of the questions I had that uh, people send in for you were about, uh, you know, what are alternatives to NPK? How do we replenish the soil uh, fertilizer to use? And um, my girlfriend was saying a mix of peat moss and indigenous microorganisms is really all you need. Like a lot of people just ask, what do I buy? But ideally, you 
learn to make your own soil, right? You're not really buying stuff from the store, but if someone were to buy something, would it be peat moss to start or? I think I bought chicken. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> There's a reason chickens are so integrated with humanity, you know? They're very functional. They do so many things. But yeah, concentrating, you know, bird manure. Chickens are the gateway animal. So um, chicken, you know, like including chickens, including poultry generally, ducks. Chickens are great. They're much easier, I think, really, in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, in, in, including poultry um, in, our, in our systems. And then looking at fungi, which has been really fashionable today. I mean, ways that we can increase fungal activity, and, and it's innumerable. I mean, even allelopathy in, in plants, we have a lot of eucalypts in Australia, obviously, right? and, and some places you have a lot of pine, let's say, and they're allelopathic, right? They don't favor the mulch from these plants. Anything that's allelopathic doesn't favor the, uh, the growth of other plants. But if you, if you increase the surface area, would wood chipping it or sawdust make it into sawdust or chop it up really fine and make a big pile of it over a cubic meter in size and keep it keep it damp and shady once it gets ear fungus once you get fungus all over it the allelopathy is broken and you can use it as mulch and it will it, it will favor other plants but there's amazing ways that we can increase fungal relationships now sepholzer you've heard of sepholzer in Austria. So he, he, he came up with a system called Hugel culture. It's a German name, Hugel culture, mm -hmm. where they bury wood in a mound. In, 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 the, in the climates that are very fungal, which are your, your cool climates, like where you are, you know, most of your decomposition happens in winter, not in summer, which is the growing period. And, and, and that's when you get a lot of fungal activity. So increasing decomposition by burying wood in some of those climates or at least laying it out on contour so it gets moisture quickly increases your fungal interactions. And, and then you've got people like Paul Stamets in America, fungi perfecti, um, and, and you can actually buy particular fungal spores and, and you know get beneficial fungi that you can eat and fungi that actually um bioremediate pollution and all these different functions of fungi i mean this is just the cutting edge of this stuff so one of the biggest functions of fungi is accumulations of phos of, of of um um phosphates so they're, they're phosphate accumulators mm -hmm. potassium ha potassium uh, occurs in all green material that's why when you have a fire, when you burn green material, when you, you burn the, the forest, a lot of the, the phosphate goes up, the potassium, sorry, a lot of the potassium, potash, potassium, goes up in smoke. So potassium, shortened to potash, goes up in smoke. It's in all green material. Now, you get a certain amount of potassium left over in the ash. But ash is so fine, it's colloidal, that it's made up of particles smaller than 15 microns, like soap and, and, and clay. They're colloidal. When the water goes soapy color, the particles are colloidal that, are, that have made the water go milky color. When the, you got clay in water and it all turns to the same color as the clay, it, the small particles are 15 microns in size. There are, there are ratios of size that are kind of important to understand. Fly ash is less than 15 microns in size. So when it rains on the fly ash or any like hot ash, some vegetation that's burned off and, and has become fine fly ash, it leaches through the soil particles. It leaches quickly. You lose the potassium. You've got to lock it up in a worm farm or you've got to lock it up in a, a compost heap. So it is true that you get potassium and and with the ash you get alkalinity like when you have a fire but you lose most of it up in the air to smoke so just green mulches the reason that we put a layer of green a layer of brown and a layer of manure into compost is you're getting a combination of those elements green potassium the brown the phosphate with the fungal interaction 
and the manure, the nitrogen. It's an NPK set of layers. Then you just chuck a few sexy bits in there and you've got some of the other stuff too. That's not so hard. It's not so hard to chuck in some hair and chuck in a dead armadillo or something or some, some fish or some crayfish or, you know, like some old seeds. It can be anything. It, if it's lived, it can live again. It's the first rule of compost. But interestingly, you need the green potassium, mm -hmm. brown phosphate, mm -hmm. manure, nitrogen. You need an NPK layer, but it, the balance in compost is carbon nitrogen. So above those is a carbon nitrogen balance. Carbon being the sponge that stops it exploding and nitrogen being the explosive. So you capture the explosion of nitrogen in the carbon. And a good composter, a master composter, loses no volume. You, you, what you start, you, know, you start with a cubic meter, you end up with a cubic meter. You start with two cubic meters, you end up with two cubic meters. You know, if you're a, you know, an, a, a super master composter ends up with larger volume than they started, just a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah, we use like fish amino acids here and LAB, and those seem pretty easy to do, like leftover fish. And then we have leftover clabbered milk or whatever and kind of ferment it. Um, I wanted to ask you about fulvic and humic acid. Like, are, the, are, are those being deficient a problem? Because um, I know that there are so many things in the municipal water, especially in the states that are really toxic like instead of chloramine there's instead of chlorine there's chloramine and we have instead of fluoride hydrofluorosilicic acid which is like more toxic than fluoride and we have like tons of like synergistical tetragenic uh things in our water supply and it just blows my mind that people are watering their garden with that uh, let alone under acid rain with the fertilizer from walmart or whatever um <laughs> so do you think like people can have deficiency in like fulvic and humic in their garden or <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you would if you have to use i definitely wouldn't drink it um I'm, i drink rainwater uh, i wouldn't drink anything else if i could help it um and and i know in america people are really worried about that in fact i nearly got sort of lynched in a course in louisiana once because i filled the water uh the water cooler up with rainwater one night and brought it into the classroom early and put it in the water cooler and let everybody drink it all day and i didn't tell them till the end of the day and they were kind of a bit concerned but we've done that forever um because you when you've got your own rainwater you can control it and and if it's a little bit acid you just add a bit of limestone and it neutralizes or goes into hard water which is our al slightly alkaline water which we know now is better for our health but um yeah you would be better off uh oxygenate in that that uh mates water if you could for an hour which is uh it, it's going to take quite a bit of electricity and you really want the same amount of air going through the water as there is volume of water so if you've got a cubic meter of water or you know let's say i don't know you're, you're in gallons so let's say you've got a hundred gallons of water uh you need to put a hundred gallons of air through it every minute and you can blow off a lot of those chloramines and fluoramines into the atmosphere um, with the oxygenation. Um, but if you can't do that, and that's the only water you've got, and most people I've noticed in America just don't put in big enough water tanks, it would be much easier if you were metric because it's much easier to calculate with most things. So, you know, one, mil one millimeter of rain and one square meter gives you one liter of water. So it's really easy calculation in the decimal world um but if you're if you're dealing with you know inches of rain and square foot of roof and gallons it's a different calculation but you've got a calculator um but um if you have to use that water then you need deep mulches and you need good quality compost mm -hmm. so um you you need to put cover crops down and, you know it, it's only really cover crop the garden in and and the roots stay in the ground if possible you don't dig them up you don't dig them in you just cut the tops off them and use the tops as mulch um on top of that then you've got compost and there's different qualities of how good a compost but really it's a life 
inoculum that you're putting in the soil. It's not a soil amendment that we're trying to create. By default, it's a soil amendment. But the reality is, the real quality is, what volume and diversity of beneficial soil life have you got in your compost? Right, Because that's what you're adding to your soil. And then your deep mulches, um, so, you know, which is like straw and, 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 and um, it might be grain straw that's from grain production, or it might just be hay from a field. Now, people have all kinds of concerns about that. I say, oh, what about the weed seeds in the hay? Well, I don't care. Uh, seeds have been alive and they'll, and they'll decompose if you do the right thing. It's a germination condition I'm more worried about. I don't care what seeds I put in the mulch at all. Um, what, what about the, the, the chemicals that are on the grain that, that you know, straw, you know, because it grew wheat or it grew barley or it grew some commercial grain? I don't care about that either. Right? Because in but because I use that much mulch and that much compost and that much worm juice and that much worm castings and sometimes compost tea and sometimes biofertilizer, all these things that favor life in the, in the soil and the decomposition cycles, that the, the amount of carbon compared to the amount of minor toxins that are there right, get bogged up in the decomposition cycle. So the, the carbon... Carbon is a cube, right? and in the decomposition process, that is the hardest things on, uh, in the known universe. Diamonds are made out of carbon. Life is based in carbon. So all the soil life and all the interactions of life through the decomposition process, in other words, billions, gazillions of little bodies are die, live and die and live and die and live and die and live and die and, and put in their carbon combinations they're unique carbon combinations into that cycle that what happens is the minor toxins and minor volume of toxins it can be quite toxic in great elements they can be very toxic but only a minor amount right? and we are only talking about a very minor amount compared to the amount of carbon we're chucking at the garden what happens is that the carbon molecule becomes a long chain molecule and the toxic elements are attached on that long chain and become inert. So it's really ashes to ashes, dust to dust at that point. Your, your toxins have gone back into the natural cycles and bonded onto the carbon molecule to become a long chain molecule that is now inert and no longer a problem. So we, we've never created anything. Humanity has never created anything. Creation is quite different to reassembly. We've dissected things out of the world and we've taken particular elements and reassembled them in crazy order. Now, if we put that back into the, the natural cycles, it gets reassembled in natural order through the decomposition process. And, and most hard science doesn't want to admit that that's actually what's happening. They, they don't want to say, well, like, you know, a lot of the answer to this is microorganisms we can't even see and don't understand and haven't even named or percentified them yet. And it's really down to mucky things like compost that builds, you know, the composting process, the soil decomposition, the carbon decomposition process, the life cycles that actually holds all of life on earth together. They don't want to honor that because you can't, you can't really replicate it. You can't say, oh, I've got, I've got something that does it as a, you know, I've got a machine that does it instead. Um, and, and in some cases, people want to extract energy out of it rather than food. But I've had that experience where, um, you know, te young technocrats, some of the best in the world, wanted to extract energy from anaerobic composting um, of uh, city waste and taking the volume down to 5% uh, with no particular soil value except for a bit of soil amendment, in other words, structure, but no life, but to get energy out of it to run gadgets in, a, in, the, in, the, you know, in the energy grid. Um, but ignoring the fact that 40% of all energy required by a city is agricultural food. You can have the best technology in the world for carbon neutrality of a city. You can have a carbon neutral city with technology up to 60%. And it looks like the Jetsons, you know? It's like really high tech, right? 
But the last 40% is agriculturally produced food to get carbon neutrality. And there you lose unless you go into ecosystem partnerships. And that's unacceptable to the technocrats of the world because they can't really patent it. It's patent, it's life. And, and, they, and, and we'll never understand it. And they don't want to deal with it. And they can't understand, measure, quantify, and percentify. They, they can't accept infinity. And, and, and infinity is a really nice thing. You know, eternity, infinity, infinity um, it's a really nice thing to be comfortable with. That's awesome. Because <laughs> sooner or later, we've, we've, you're going to have to become, you're going to have to become comfortable with it sooner or later because you're part of it. Absolutely. That, that's awesome. <laughs> I know a lot of people freaked out about glyphosate and nanoparticulates and geoengineering spraying and all these different things. And um, I like your solution, whether it's the human body or the soil, the solution is uh, carbon, right? And kind of like just squashing it out with life, life supporting substances. <laughs> Carbon is your sponge. And I, I try and get my students to repeat that like a kind of mantra because it, it sort of takes it, you know, it's like learning your ABC and your one, two, three, you know. Carbon is your sponge. Carbon is your sponge. Carbon is your sponge. You just got to keep repeating it and um, get familiar with it because there's uh, going to have to be a lot of it around. Nothing else has ever done it. Before. You know, that's the only sponge there is. That's awesome. Uh, have you ever heard of like Shilajit? Like that, it's like, it's a really dense form of carbon, but it comes out of like the Himalayan mountains or different high elevation mountains, but it's, it's condensed carbon of all these different, over thousands of years, um, just decomposing uh, plant and animal matter in this like little like tar. Um, supposedly monkeys have eaten it and people, indigenous people have eaten it um, all around the world. But yeah, there's carbon's interesting to me. It's, uh, I mean, people like activated charcoal which I don't agree with. They use that in like water filters, but people take activated charcoal. It's a health thing now pretty regularly. <laughs> well, again, you know, the biochar and the activated charcoal has enormous surface area. So when we go down to something colloidal, the advantage of something colloidal is that the surface area is massive, ridiculous. We can't even imagine it. So when you've got biochar and activated charcoal, You've got in one tablespoon of activated charcoal, you've got a surface area of about 10 acres. Now you've got to look at it under a microscope before you realize how, how can that be possible? But then when you look at it under a microscope, you think, oh my goodness, look at this thing. It's just so, it has so much surface area. It's so jagged. It has so many air spaces in it. And really, you know, um, they're like um, high rise buildings for microbes. They, they, they provide habitat. And if you start using the microscope, which we've had to do in recent years with the soil food web, at, at 200 times magnification, you can see fungi quite comfortably. At 400 magnification, fungi are getting a little bit big. You start to look at the, you know, the strand. And at 600 magnification, it's too big. You're looking at the hairs on the fungi's leg kind of thing. You know, it's getting too close. But, but bacteria start to come into focus. So at, at 600, you can't see too many features of bacteria, but you can start to see them. You can start to see them buzzing around like little dots moving about because they're that much smaller. Now, um, the reason that bacteria create crumb structure, little colonies, is it, sticking the soil together into tiny little crumbs is so they don't wash away, so they don't wash they're vulnerable to being washed down through the soil, right? You know, through uh, sand and silt particles. Um, so they bond together as little colonies and create, you know, stuck together with sticky, starchy substances. So they harvest extra starch from the plant and stick, stick themselves together. So that's why farmers look at the crumb structure of soil at surface. If you lift any ground cover, perennial or annual, it's been established for a little while. You lift it up carefully and then you grab the top layer of soil. You always see, you'll always see crumb structure because the ground cover covering the surface makes a micro canopy habitat that's friendly to soil organisms just underneath. So, you know, when you're, when you're creating a, a forest, it's very essential to have ground covers um, over the soil because they trap 
carbon rich elements that add to the soil and crumb structure it is is a beneficial form the biodynamic people are always talking about crumb structure being the ultimate aesthetic of the soil when you have biochar and you eat it you're you've got this vacant block of flats going past the bacteria that might be pathogens there might be you know pathogens that are making you sick there might be bacteria in your gut that want to jump into those block of flats that jump into that sort of that habitat and get passed by the body so it goes on past so you know if you've got if you've got diarrhea you've got some kind of illness often you know when you're traveling people say oh you know an, an alternative healthy thing is to take some charcoal um well it's because a, it, it's a very very luxurious housing complex that you've just offered the bacteria they go wow i'd move in there i look safe in there so it becomes occupied so um now there's a lot of talk about you know you you charge your biochar with compost tea so the compost tea the organisms the beneficial organisms in the compost tea jump into the biochar and then become more stable in your soil now where this is most beneficial is in the wet tropics because in the wet tropics six degrees in the equator you have two rainy seasons a year huge raindrops very heavy rain large amount of rain over the year and very shallow soils so they're the most vulnerable they're most vulnerable to being washed through if you do anything that disturbs the soil remember that 98 percent of the sunlight is filtered out naturally in the tropical forests only two percent of the sunlight actually reaches the soil in in the in at near the equatorial zones the double equatorial rainy season zone six degrees north or south of the equator within there so there that's where we do discovered that there was a lot of biochar being used because people saw the benefit of it now it's not necessarily that valuable in other places i mean also you know where you've got these wet equatorial zones it's kind of hard to get things to burn and you've got surplus organic matter i mean the, the the growth rate's rather fast to put it mildly so you want to go if you start using a lot of your vegetation to make biochar in slow growing areas you've got to be careful that you're not burning off too much of your vegetation which you need you know you, your soils in in the cold climates are amazingly fertile um, and you just got to do the right thing and it all releases wonderfully well um so you know they they, they become fads these fads are kind of dangerous you know, one minute it's vetiver, next minute it's azolla, you know, next minute it's wheatgrass, you know, then it's like biochar and, you know, it's something else. You know, <laughs> unless it's something that actually builds soil and increases ecosystem diversity, just it's, it's useful. It's a nice component. It's just a component in a larger system, you know. Um, you need a relationship and relationships are never simple. They're always complex. You need to be in an intimate relationship with your productive ecosystem. And, you know, it, it kind of feels like you know every move it makes, but you're always being a little bit surprised. And it demonstrates its own evolutions. And after a while, it feels like it knows every move you're going to make as well. When, once it realizes you're friendly and reveals more of itself to you, you know, it re it, it's a communication. It's a communication. You're you're in you're 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 having a conversation with an ecosystem really over a period of time. And and when you move quickly from one place to another, like like I've had to do and I've sacrificed to do, I uh, I you know, means I don't have quite as deep a relationship as I could have with my subtropical landscape I live in. But I've I've had to learn how to speak to a desert landscape, get in a conversation with a desert landscape and a wet tropical landscape and a cold landscape and 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 you know there are many cold landscapes and they have different dialects sometimes you can't hear what it's saying because it's speaking with a dialect right you know it's it, you do you do know that word but when it's spoken with that accent you might have to be patient until you understand it right i didn't quite hear what you said what did you say you know it's like listening to someone speak english with a scottish accent you know it's not it's english but it's kind of a bit different it's like that <laughs> you've got to have a good ear you know for this and and um, yeah and, and it's not easily learned it you can get the system it can be taught and then you've got to then you you've got to be 
um, receptive. That's awesome. What are your thoughts on hydroponic gardening that doesn't use any soil? I've heard it's not good. <laughs> well, your energy audits are very bad. Um, the food itself is not bad. Like when we measure food, it's not too bad because you're growing on a lot of beneficial organisms that where the nitrite converts to nitrate through the oxygenation through the media and on the surface of the media are a lot of beneficial algaes and they're interesting algaes are interesting surface area is large but you can't grow another pump you can't grow another pipe and you're not growing any soil so it, it it's kind of like emergency surgery it might get you out of your the situation you're in you might be in a really bad situation you can't get out of the city for instance you know you can't get out of this craziness um i'm, I'm never going to have that problem because i'm allergic to cities um, i've got about 10 days before I, i've got to get out um but you know it, they're all short term they don't last long do they i mean they really don't you just follow the history of large aquaponic projects they don't last long um it's like these monoculture fruit orchards that are covered in hail netting um, to stop the fruit getting damaged by hail. The day the hail net collapses, the orchard collapses because no one can afford to replace that hail net. It's the end of it. You have to have made your money before the hail net collapses. With the aquaponics, you've got to make your money before the pumps and the pipes collapse because there isn't enough residual to put it back together. So it, it's false economics. It's false energy auditing. Although, like I say, it's not bad food, it's okay, it's okay, and it might be emergency. I'm not sure it's even emergency. It is emergency food kind of thing. But if you're, if you're not investing in soil, it's like you're living on your bank card without paying the interest. We all know what happens after a while. Um, you've got to be getting your interest invested in soil. Your investment, your long-term investment has to be in soil. Then you can make a lot of mistakes, make a lot of mistakes because the soil is always there as a backup. But if you do, if you haven't got any damn soil, it's like living on two bank cards and getting one to pay the other one. <laughs> it's like sooner or later you're going to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so you must have that investment in at least in soil. You know, we can we can cut an ecosystem down, and there's only one way you can burn it. And, and lose nothing and it's to compost it compost is a slow fire that loses no volume really it's a it's a fire of life it's a life fire the the life is on fire in 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 the decomposition process and and by not losing any volume you can put the ecosystem back you've lost a period of time and this is why regenerative forests are more dense and and have more mass than Climax forest. The climax forests are more sophisticated. The long term long term product is very sophisticated. Trees that live for hundreds and hundreds of years have a very high quality timber product that you can't replace with a monoculture. It's not possible. They've never been done ever anywhere in the world. We cut those trees once out of an ecosystem. We never cut them again because we it, it's only an ecosystem produces that quality of wood. We should pay attention to that. You know. It's very low quality trees that are, are grown as, as monocultures. But on the way up, on the way up, the diversity is bizarre. The mass is bizarre on a regenerating forest. So, you know, the lessons are all in front of us. The, the, the ecosystem is always demonstrating its evolutions for us to listen to, but we don't listen. We don't even try and speak that language. We don't try and get in that conversation. It's like, it's like, Having someone argue with you or, 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 or insult you and not understood and not giving you a chance to explain yourself. It's just, you know, there's no chance of saying, look, you just made a mistake. I'm sorry, but it's too late. They, they, they shout at you and walk away. You know, that's not very productive. You know, you may be misreading the situation. You didn't quite understand the language or the words that were used. You know, so, we, you know, this is a lovely thing. This is a lovely, you know, this is a, a lovely conversation, actually. Most people don't hear this stuff, but they need to. I love it. That's a great analogy. Yeah, that's not a good way to go about a relationship, whether it's a romantic one with your partner or whether it's one with your environment. Um, 
really great analogies. This is a good final question, I think, before we wrap it up. Uh, how would you turn a desert into farmlands? And I'm, I'm sure you have material on YouTube out there about it, but is it kind of what you were talking about with planting trees and things that work together, like having the different stories? Yeah, well, not all the desert can be farmland. Um, and um, if you look historically, um, people pick the eyes out of the desert for the most uh, valuable pieces. So um, you don't want to try and turn everything. But even if you are forced onto the wrong slopes, you can do it. You can do it. And we've had to do it in the Dead Sea Valley. We're on a westerly rocky slope. Um, and we've still produced in 10 years uh, more or less a, a productive oasis that's uh, attracted some attention. But ideally, you pick the good spots. Um, and um, one of the biggest um, mistakes people make is uh, broad area cropping. Um, you need the smallest area cropping in the dry, hot, dry deserts. Uh, so dry lands where evaporation is much higher than rainfall. Um, you have fields that are no bigger than quarter to half an acre in size. And they have to be surrounded by forest. But that can be productive forest. Um, and, and then when you get to the tropics, the crop fields are no bigger than two acres. And traditionally, that's all around the world. In all history, they were never bigger than two acres. And when you get to your cold climate, right, you can go three or four acre field if you want to. But that is, again, surrounded by an ecosystem of trees, which can be productive. Now, today we have laser levels and we have leveling. So we can pick a distance on those size ratios. And we can go out on lineage on contour. Uh, we can harvest water on contour and soak it into the soils. So everything that you do in the desert is an anti-evaporation strategy. Because as soon as you reduce the evaporation, you increase the potential productivity in life. So shade, wind, and organic matter are your biggest friends. Of, so you, you design systems that shade quickly. So very hardy legume trees uh, put up mass. And they also buffer the wind, reducing it more evaporation. And they also drop organic matter. And you can increase their organic matter fall by cutting them regularly when, when the rain, when the cooler rainy period starts. So you always cut your perennial mulch uh, for organic matter in the soil. When evaporation over rainfall finishes and rainfall over evaporation starts. So in the desert, that's whenever it damn well rains or when it normally starts raining because a desert is a flood waiting to happen. You get half the year's rain in four hours on average. In the temperate zones, in the cold, cooler temperate zones like where you are, it's at the end of summer when it gets really, really hot and then it changes to the autumn rains and you open up your system to the sun in the winter and your decomposition during winter or your cut organic matter material turns into soil over winter and in the tropics it's the opposite end of the year it's the start of summer because rains are, are are a summer feature in the tropics so it's the end of winter start of summer in the tropics so you 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 cycle your organic matter you increase your organic matter you you can you make sure there's plenty of shade and um and you make sure there's plenty of wind buffering and that extends the small amount of water you've got. You don't open your fields up more than half to quarter of an a uh, quarter to half an acre. Um, and uh, you continue to use all your normal organic methods, which is uh, you know your composting systems and your worm farm systems and your cover crop systems when they're whatever time of year they're appropriate. And you and you'll do really well. I mean, the, you grow very very healthy food in in the deserts. It's one of the healthiest climates to live in when you do it right and one of the most unhealthy climate food producing systems when you do it chemically or, or you know, um, uh, industrially. So your industrial food in deserts is uh, very high in toxins and you see that in hot spots in cancer in the, in the desert agriculture um, uh, populations. Uh, but if you do it right, um, you get very high nutrition, you get very few funguses, you get very few diseases, uh, you get very few problems. It's a very healthy place if you, you do everything environmentally and organically. But it is all about shade. Even, even your eventual forest must have a high shade canopy. 
Um, it's all about shutting down that sunlight. Your gardens are, are, are in the real hot deserts. Your, your garden is almost in a cage. You know, you've got 50% um, shade over the top, 75% shade on the sunset western side, 30% shade on the uh, east sunrise side, and 20% shade on the sun side. And you don't need any shade on the shade side because nothing, no sun comes in that way. So you, you're in a three-sided cage almost um, with specific percentages um, over your home garden. Um, you also use um, uh, trellis vines to increase shade. So um, high trellis, um, high wire trellis can make your gardens a lot more comfortable. A lot of vine crop. Um, a lot of shade vines, um, and you can end up with a very beautiful scenario in the desert. That's awesome. Well, um, thanks so much, Jeff, for your time. This was really fun, and I learned so much, and your enthusiasm is definitely infectious. And I love just the way, the simple way you explain things. That's the mark of a good educator. Um, the analogies that you use, it's just really easy um, for me to understand these new concept, concepts that you're introducing. So, um, that was just awesome. <laughs> and, uh, where can people, um, find your videos and your website and, um, all your material? Jeff Lawton online is probably the biggest collection. Um, and we have our own, um, email group there. So if you put your email into Jeff Lawton online, you keep up to date with all our new stuff. Uh, we're making videos just about every week. Um, we have a new online course that's about to be released, which is, uh, probably 50 times more information than you can get in a face-to-face -face course. And um, I try and specialize in, in, in creating very active students. I always have. Um, and nothing is more successful than our online course in creating active students. It's an event. So you, you take it with everybody together from all, all around the world. We have our own Facebook group. We have our own discuss forum. And we have over 800 videos on that online course. It goes for about 28 weeks. It's a phenomena. And, and, and the designs that people produce at the end of the course are, well, 20% of them are better than anything I'll ever be able to do. They're, they're, they're um, quite incredible. In fact, a lot of my staff have come out of my online courses um, and offered their services to the work that we do. Um, it, 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 and you only have to hear the reviews and see some of the previews of, our, of the way we produce our online education. You can replay it and replay it forever. And, mm -hmm. and um, 350 animations that we've made ourselves, our own color palette, our own icons. Um, and we continue to improve it continuously. So um, I couldn't recommend it any higher. Um, I know, you know what it's done for people. And I'm so lucky to have the uh, team that's enabled us to do, to produce such uh, good quality online education. So that's that's a big thing. Otherwise, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all of that, we're out there on all of that stuff. But jefflawtononline.com, um, have a look at what's coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, join the team and you'll enjoy, enjoy learning as we go. I love it. Well, uh... Thanks so much, Jeff, and uh, stick around as I uh, close out the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Good one, man. Well, that talk definitely blew my mind. Uh, Jeff is a master at what he does, uh, a legend, you could say, and I consider him the world's expert on NPK fertilizer, which is really an unspoken uh, problem of drinking NPK grown green juice. Basically that juicer becomes a concentrator of NPK fertilizer and that's really not good. And I think it causes a lot of disease uh, drinking green juices grown with NPK fertilizer and tap water under acid rain with bio sludge. That's an issue. And just eating a lot of vegetables that were grown in soil that's not only depleted, but toxic. It's a really important distinction to make. And I truly have to credit the people over at Pristine Hydro or Live Pristine for turning me onto this information years ago, because it took 
many years for it to sink in, just really the, the devastating uh, reality of this situation. It, re- it really is uh, devastating for, for a bit until you realize that there's a direction that we move in. And it takes a long time, it'll take years, but at least it's a direction other than not knowing where to go. So to me, understanding this whole NPK fertilizer history with Justice von Liebig and this problem that we have is a first step <laughs> to, to understanding where we can go in the future. So I love the Q&A. We didn't get through most of the messages. I think I only asked them three or four questions there. But uh, I'll do my best to answer some of them here uh, because I thought there were some good ones. Um, I've heard Matt say that Shilajit is the answer to NPK grown veggies. What does it do? So Shilajit is a substance that I've been taking for years in various forms, uh, largely the powder. Um, and then now I sell the Panacea MitoLife tablets. It's a natural source of fulvic acid. Uh, fulvic and humic acids are naturally occurring acids that are found in the soil, that should be found in the soil, that allow processes to work, that break down inorganic minerals into organic minerals. So it's that conversion process that uses bacteria, fulvic acid, and fungus to convert an inorganic non-carbon bonded mineral into a carbon bonded organic mineral. That process is not working anymore because of acid rain, tap water, NPK fertilizer, bio sludge, and pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, larvicides, etc. That whole combination screws up the entire carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, mineral cycle, phosphate cycle, silica cycle. The whole thing is off. And so shilajit is a way to take naturally occurring natural fulvic acid, a whole food supplement into your body that will chelate and complex all monovalent and divalent atoms. That's what the fulvic acid does. And there's not many studies on it because it's a natural substance. You can't patent it. It's not a pharmaceutical drug. It's oozing out of mountains. You want to get some, you just go to high elevation mountains and find it oozing out and you just grab it. It's a tar. Usually it's six or 7,000 feet, so you have to go pretty high up. But it's a pure medicine, and it contains all 84-plus known and unknown minerals bound to carbon, organic form, with fulvic acid, complexed with fulvic acid. And so it's a mineral balancer and a mineral supplement. It's, it's really foundational, and it's really incredible how much it does. And it doesn't take much. I mean, five tablets a day is one gram of the MitoLife Panacea, and it goes really well with coffee. Or if you go out to eat and you don't know what they're putting in the food or what it was grown with, which is pretty much all the time. (laughs) This was a funny one. Do animals that consume NPK-grown foods pass along any detriments to carnivores? (laughs) So people on the carnivore diet. Um, Yes, I believe so. It is uh, less of a problem because the animal acts as a primary filter to the toxins. And so you're the secondary filter, but they're still getting fibrotic and they're still getting advanced glycation end products and cross-linking uh, from, from the food. But, you know, we're not in a perfect world. We're moving towards a better direction all the time. And so you do your best, but I think the problem with the carnivore diet less than NPK is really the lack of carbohydrate or sugar, which is the primary fuel of the cell. And the liver needs glycogen to perform its 500 functions. And you have muscle glycogen, which is a little more than the liver glycogen, but Still, the liver is our primary battery pack. That's not meant to be chronically drained because when it is, you have cortisol and adrenaline liberating free fatty acids from your adipose tissue and amino acids from your muscle tissue. 
then those further suppress thyroid function and your metabolism, uh, leading to a lot of issues. So I'd say NPK is one of the last problems on a carnivore diet. <clears throat> then we had a lot of questions. What's the link between soil nutrition and nutrition of the food that we eat? How does NPK affect health? How can we fight the effects of NPK? Was the correlation between the use of NPK and higher rates of autism? Best way to repair gut lining after years of NPK. I look at Sheila G as the solution for all of it. And I know I'm definitely not speaking for uh, Jeff Lawton here. You heard him talk a little bit about carbon and the power of carbon in the interview. But for me personally, and for my family and friends, we're on Sheila Jeet, which is loaded with carbon. And it's way better than taking burnt uh, coconut shells or uh, breaking down a water filter and eating it, which is what activated charcoal is. I, I would rather take a natural substance uh, that God made, which is uh, shilajit. It's pure substance. And it's very, very minimal processing to get that. It's just a little filtration process, and you just take the resin, the, t the compressed resin in tablets. And to me, that is the answer to NPK fertilizer. Because you have the fulvic acid in there, and you have all of the minerals in there, copper, which regulates iron, and they're all in the perfect ratio and the perfect form for human health. Someone says, how can we make organic farming sustainable on a large scale? That's definitely a question for uh, Jeff that we didn't get to. Um, definitely go to his website. It's uh, Jeff Lawton. That's spelled G-E-O-F-F. Lawton, L-A-W-T-O-N, online.com. And you could access his uh, courses. He has something called the Permaculture Circle, which I believe a lot of it is free. I'm looking at it as Q&As, a six and a half hour permaculture quick start lecture, just a lot of material. Um, I could see how someone like this definitely needs to have courses set up because there's just so much information that he would just be likely repeating the same stuff over and over on podcasts, um, which is why I like that he went into a little bit of philosophy here and his thoughts on cities and stuff, because um, I can imagine it gets boring talking about the same uh, stuff over and over and over, the same, same solutions. Um, I do my best, and I do my best to make it fun, and I constantly add more advanced things in addition to the foundational things, and always learning more about how things that I talk about like lipofuscin uh, are causing harm in different ways, newly discovered ways. But uh, which fruits and vegetables are least toxic and does it make a difference buying organic? I think it definitely makes a difference buying organic. It's, it's way better than conventional. Uh, fruits and vegetables, least toxic. I would say fruits are better than vegetables because with a fruit, you have a tree, whereas with vegetable, it's just in the dirt. It's direct roots to plant. But with a tree, you have a trunk, and it's being filtered to some degree. So NPK fertilizer, it's my understanding. I wanted to ask this question to Jeff, but it's less an issue with fruit, and it's more an issue with vegetables. Fruit are just a better food all around than vegetables, in my opinion. Vegetables have benefits, but fruits... Uh, especially with their sugar, have way more benefits with that that good healing fructose. How outrageous is it to reverse NPK damage and saturation to our soils was another question. Um, I think Jeff's approach was really cool. Just even with tap water, just regulating the pH, just doing the basics and just saturating the soil with all the life-supporting substances so that the other stuff gets washed out. Um, the worst thing that I've seen with store-bought soil uh, happened at this house that I bought in Idaho is those little pellets. They're like little blue plastic pellets, and they never degrade. It's just made of petroleum and super toxic. And that's the worst, these slow-release little pellets in the fertilizer. That's the hardest to get rid of. Because you're pretty much talking about getting rid of plastic. I don't know if fungus could maybe do it. But I would say the basics, like you talked about, uh, mulch, compost, biochar, 
If you want to do LAB, fish amino acids, FAA, those little inputs, and just do what you can to uh, support the soil. Even a little bit of peat moss can help, or worm castings are huge. Peat moss and worm castings are really big from what I've learned for soil health. And so that kind of answers a lot of the other questions I received. Uh, how to create great soil, tips for an organic gardener, beginner. I would recommend if someone's beginning gardening, just sign up. It's free on Jeff's courses. Um, at least a lot of his material is free on his website. And you just put in your email and your name. And you could watch his videos on permaculture. And you'll, you'll learn a lot there. I'd say it's definitely uh, more valuable than watching uh, Netflix. <laughs> Someone asked, are there any implications of using organic NPK on your lawn? Um, I don't think it's too big of a deal. I guess if you have you know deer foraging there because deer eat grass, or other animals like geese. We have geese here. They eat grass. Um, that might be an issue, but if you don't plan on doing animal agriculture, uh, maybe not. Um, I would say just giving the grass better water would be ideal. <laughs> just throwing a shower filter on there, even if it's a small lawn. Uh, which veggies are okay to eat, someone asked. Um, I wouldn't sweat it. I would just make veggies kind of a condiment, maybe 5% of your diet, very small amount. I really like Dr. Cowan's powders. These are vegetables that are sourced from sustainable, organic, slash biodynamic farms that are at least doing it better than most of the other farms. And they dehydrate them within a couple days and go into myron glass jars. And that's great on potatoes. Uh, granted, a lot of different things. So I love uh, Dr. Cowan's powders. And you could actually use the discount code Blackburn to save. Um, right now, I'm using their root medley powder, uh, parsnip powder. I love their wild ramps powder. And it's a great way to just increase the diversity in your diet. What's the best way to keep the soil safe from acid rain? I don't think there's a way out, unless you have a greenhouse. So for practical sake... I believe it's generally better to have animal agriculture outdoors. And then if you're going to cultivate plants, do that uh, in a greenhouse. Ideally, where natural light can come in through the greenhouse, but just protected from the rain with filtered water. And that might sound like I'm a perfectionist, but you definitely would get better produce that way than growing it under open air, in my opinion. Someone says, my soil always struggle, struggles with calcium deficiency no matter what I do. So according to my girlfriend, dissolved eggshells in vinegar is a really good strategy to get water-soluble uh, calcium into the soil. You can use oyster shells, uh, slow release, but I would try the eggshell and vinegar trick. That sounds pretty cool. Someone asked, does fermenting foods worsen or lessen the effects of NPK? Um, not to my knowledge. I think it helps with the plant anti-nutrients and even the PUFA, but I don't think it has any effect on the, the NPK that it was grown with. Um, someone asked, what can you do if you absolutely cannot avoid NPK other than not eating it? Uh, take Sheila G. Uh, none of us can avoid not eating it for the most part. Can we measure the difference between fruit and veg grown in tap water versus pristine water? I believe so. Uh, I believe that the con uh, nutrient content would be uh, different if you have the ability to measure that. Someone asked how to make the easiest compost with chicken manure and table scraps. Cannot have a compost pile. Um, back when I lived in Southern California, I had this tower looking thing. Uh, that eventually got torn down by a bear, but you can buy, it's like a black rectangle tower thing for composting. And it's basically uh, five or six compartments. And that worked uh, pretty well. Uh, someone asked, does fertilization levels differ depending on the country you live in? Uh, it's my understanding that NPK is worldwide. Uh, it was started in Europe, but it's worldwide now. Uh, someone asks, how long does it take to remediate soil that's been used for corn and soy? 
cultivation. Um, I think there's too many factors here. That would have been a good question for uh, Jeff Lawton if we had time. But yeah, I just think there's there's so many factors. Um, I think things that he talked about, uh, biochar, uh, compost, and if you want to get into worm castings, um, that that's probably a good idea. Someone asked, like iron and PUFAs, is NPK tied to an agenda? Uh, to me, it absolutely is. It's, it's the dumbing down, down of humanity. And to me, I look at NPK fertilizer as being uh, really close to the fluoridation uh, of humanity. A lot of people say fluoride dumps people down. I think NPK uh, does the job even better. So Jeff has a 28-week uh, online course. Um, again, his website is geoffflawtononline.com. Uh, I'm so grateful to have had the chance to speak with him. Uh, he is definitely the world's expert on uh, NPK and I think uh, gardening in general. And if you want to support this show, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I have all my recommended products. I have blog posts. I have my CLF protocol up there, uh, calcification, lipofuscin, and fibrosis. I believe that is the root cause of all disease and it's death by a thousand cuts. So it takes uh, decades, but eventually those three will take people down. And my brand is MitoLife. It's a mitochondrial focused supplement company. Uh, I have various products that people are getting awesome results with that includes uh, systemic enzymes. That's my dissolve it all product. That's really helpful for uh, fibrosis, uh, vitamin E, vitamin K2, Shilajit, called Panacea. And then I have digestive enzymes on there, Dairy Absorb, which is really helpful for digesting dairy products. A uh, few updates, the vitamin E is being upgraded. And so that's actually out of stock until about the end of next month. I'll try to rush it, but this whole uh, virus thing has just really slowed shipments, unfortunately. So until then, uh, do your best. You can try different vitamin E's, um, but mine will be awesome for lipid peroxidation, the upgraded version, and that will be coming soon. I'm also working on a magnesium uh, supplement, uh, so that's uh, getting very close as well. And just thank you for the continued support, whether you use my products or not, just supporting the show with listening and uh, leaving a review on iTunes really helps me out. And also want to give a shout out. I was just interviewed on Justin's podcast, extremehealthradio.com. Justin, Kate, that's my favorite podcast. And they just have great guests on, great information. Uh, they've had Morley Robbins on multiple times. And that was a really fun talk to go really deep into lipofuscin or lipofuscinosis, as it's called, and how it shuts down the lysosomes in the cell. The recycling center is preventing autophagy from occurring so that was a really fun chat always love talking with justin i love what they're doing over at extreme health radio today's quote is by albert howard from the book the soil and health a study of organic agriculture never does nature separate the animal and vegetable worlds this is a mistake she cannot endure and of all the errors which modern agriculture has committed this abandonment of mixed husbandry has been the most fatal.